exciting. And I'm pretty sure you noticed this is my first time doing this. So you can make fun of me and send me them pictures with the uh, memes and stuff. Um, <laughs> it was for you guys to laugh. <laughs> All right, so. Very memeable. I know, <laughs> thank you. Um, so when people think about automation, they'll probably just think we just sell cars. Um, but automation has come further than that. We don't only sell cars, new and used, but we also buy your car. Um, <coughs> we also have our brand extensions. We are selling auto gear. So now, whether you buy your car with us or not, you can get it how you want it. You want to put some big wheels, and I don't know what's called in Spanish, it's wincho, but that thing that you call and start pulling the other trucks around, you can put that too. Anything you guys want, you will get it from us. So Omination um, is America's largest automotive retailer. Um, in 2017, we had uh, over 20 billion in revenue. Um, owns and operates over 325 locations. That's more or less about 16 states. And we have, we sell 33 brands across the country. Um, so as I mentioned, the brand extensions, um, imagine if we only did just sell cars like CarMax. Um, so, <laughs> sorry. So this is more or less what I said on the on the um, slide before. Our mission is to deliver a peerless customer experience, um, not only to our customers but to our associates. We are big with our community, our manufacturers, our shareholders. Um, we have every year we ramp up our benefits. This year, we started including cancer insurance for our associates. You will get a lump amount if you, or God forbid, any of your uh, direct relatives gets deceased, automation will help you. Um, we have a 401k match up to 4%. We have an employee assistance program, business travel insurance. Um, this side, if I can't see. Um, <laughs> we have a healthcare flexible spending account if you got kids then you can also start saving money during the year to, you know, if you need that extra cash for daycare or after school activities. Um, what drives us? We are committed to our community, big time. We, um, October last year and the year before, we had this huge, what's it called, statue? Mm -hmm. Of a pink lace um, that everyone could see. It's because of breast cancer awareness, all those pink plates. Um, that commercial where you start paint, 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 paint. Yeah, I do it. Believe it or not, I've been with automation for four years. So every time I'm driving and I see a pink plate, I'm like, yes, they got it on automation. <laughs> Woo! -hoo! They're helping with cancer research. Um, so one of the things that we started, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was last year. No, sorry, the year before, was uh, trying to help those cancer patients um, that couldn't drive to their appointments, and we would save them to their appointment or driving home. Um, we do goodie bags during Christmas and we take them to children and adults that are at a hospital receiving treatment. So it's it's something that, you know, it's, you, we have to give back, we like giving back. Um, and last year, we uh, partnered up with Andy Grammer, um, who's also, who was doing his tour of uh, Give Love. So yeah, we are heavy on dry paint. I'm not gonna keep talking anymore. Um, I'm gonna <laughs> let David Arkazin, one of my co-workers, do better than I do at this. So he's all yours. Um, all the sexy voices that are cold the last couple of days, but um, on the technology side, automation, we're trying to change the rules of the road. So if any of you have been paying attention to the automotive industry, been changing a lot in the last couple of years. Electric vehicles, autonomous driving, um, a lot of disruption. Uh, a lot of the big manufacturers have announced electric vehicles in their portfolio this year and next. Um, people like Volvo are committing to moving to fully electric vehicles by 2020. Um, the, the, whole, the whole landscape is changing in the automotive space. Um, the problem is a lot of the technology is 80s technology. So there's a lot to do in the automotive space when it comes to information systems and technology. Not only are we going to bring stuff up to the current era, we've also got to like innovate and take things forward to the next, next 
step. So we like to say that uh, every timeline reveals a story. Um, if you want to talk about development in the automotive industry, we started about a thousand years ago with uh, uh, horse and carriage as the earliest form of transport. And since the early 1900s, we've been developing at an incremental rate. So, you know, first cars came out in 1908. Um, a big game changer in the 50s was the inclusion of radios in cars. It may not seem like a big deal now, but this is a, a big game changer back in the day. Um, we were formed in 1996, so compared to all of the Fortune 100 companies, we're pretty, we're like the youngest. So if you think about building up a $21 billion company within this amount of time space, we, we've come a long way. Um, one of our most recent uh, exciting partnerships is with Waymo, which is a, a Google enterprise. That's the autonomous taxis that uh, the Waymo enterprise is selling. So we partner with them to deliver all the servicing and maintenance for their vehicles. And you know, we're looking for you know bright young talent to help us, you know, continue that evolution into the next era of autonomous um, autonomous space. Some of the technologies that we're starting to play with. Um, Augmented reality, a lot of our OEMs are starting to play in this space. So, you know, a lot of the more complicated vehicles like Porsches and Ferraris and stuff like that, um, it's difficult to train certified technicians to be at the highest level standard. So what do we do? People like Porsche have now developed augmented reality that we use in our servicing bays. Somebody doesn't really know the model that's coming, they basically put on the headset and they make effectively a FaceTime call back to Porsche in Germany or Ferrari in uh, Italy, and they literally guide them through the process, literally that drawing, like undo this bolt, move that there. So there's some pretty cool stuff to do with augmented reality. Um, Internet of Things, um, we're trying to increasingly grow like automated diagnostics on cars and vehicles. Um, a lot of the manufacturers are starting to build like Internet of Things into vehicles. Um, so good example is, I think uh, GM is now, with their newest models, we, we've got the technology that the minute your car drives into one of our service bays, it automatically connects to a designated wireless network and does a diagnostics check. So by the time you've got out of your vehicle, we've already run a diagnostics check on your car and know exactly what needs to be done. And that, that kind of helps with the, the customer experience. Right? If you think something's wrong with your car, you may not know, the minute you drive in, we go, oh, you're here to get this done. Plus all the kind of preventive maintenance stuff and you know all the autonomous driving and you know level two and three autonomous driving, there's a whole bunch of sensors on the vehicles which opens up a whole different space of what happens if we screw up on those sensors and that causes the car to have a crash. You know, it's a whole different space around liability and insurance. So there's a whole bunch of cool stuff we've got to figure out uh, in that space. Um, the other side is telematic telematics. So driving on from Internet of Things. We're talking about connected vehicles, right? So one of the other future technologies we're talking about is like peer-to-peer -peer networks between vehicles, right? So when they're autonomous driving on the, on the roads, what's the next level of autonomy is the cars talk to one another and they know exactly where they are, etc. cetera. Um, there's stuff from, um, you know, Google's a good example. Their Waymo thing with autonomous taxis, okay, well, at the moment, they still rely on manual uh, servicing and sh uh, scheduling of services and up, um, maintenance of the vehicle. If the car gets in a crash, it has a flat tire, it still requires somebody to manually call us and say, hey, can I bring your car in? The next, you know, if we're talking about autonomous vehicles that can drive you to work or park itself, why can't your car take itself to go and get repaired? Why can't it take itself to go and get serviced? So there's a whole space around where maybe your car can talk to us directly, and you never need to be involved in the process of getting a service, right? Your car goes, oh, I've been 5,000 miles, I need to schedule my regular service, I'm gonna drop you off at work, come to automation, we'll service it, come back, it'll pick you up at the end of the day and we just call you for your payment at the end of the day, or if we put that on the line, it's done, right? That, that's the kind of future state of driving we're talking about. The technology doesn't exist for that, so there's a whole bunch of stuff that we could be doing. Um, you know, there's other telemetry around, you know, connected um, traffic and road management, all that stuff. Probably not in our space, but there's a huge market around this space. So even if you're not thinking about us, you can probably start thinking, you know, the future of connected vehicles and traffic management, all that good stuff. There's a lot of work to be done there. And again, 
a lot of it works off of 80s technology. Right? So there's a lot of work and opportunity. Yeah. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Lewis because a lot of the cool stuff we do with technology is driven through projects. So Lewis is going to talk about technology projects. Right. So what I'm here to do is to tell you how to get from here to there. Right. There's a lot of cool stuff happening in the automotive industry and especially uh, in technology. So I wanted to tell you about a little bit about my journey, right, and how did I get here? Okay, because honestly, it wasn't easy. But anyway, <laughs> so first of all, when I was in the space, right, and I was a young man, uh, I wanted to know what I was gonna do, and I'm going, I'm going to college, right? So I made it, like, you know, high school, whatever. So mom says, uh, you know what? You would be a great psychologist. And I'm like, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, you have a kind personality, and people like you, and you listen to people, and stuff like that. And I said, Mom, but you know what? It sounds kind of boring. I mean, sitting in a room with people and then hearing their problems and stuff, <laughs> and, you know, going home and, I don't know, going to bed or something. So uh, he said, no, 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 trust me, trust me. I'm in this field. I'm in this field. So you'll, you'll do fine. What happens when you do something that you don't want to do? You usually don't do well. Okay, so okay, go to university, and this is the University of Puerto Rico, by the way. And I chose, I, I started looking into the basic courses, then the second year, you know, some psychology, whatever, blah, blah. And I start going down my grades, so I'm like, ding, 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 ding. And then, and then the student center looking really exciting, and my friends are playing music there, and we're hanging out, and maybe cut a class here and there, but whatever. <laughs> so, guess what happened? Stop. I'm not doing this anymore. After two and a half years, I got so bored, I dropped out. And my mom said, well, okay, my mom kindly said, you know, you make your decisions and I'll be there to follow you when you fall. Okay, so she was there. Okay, and I could live in the house and everything was peachy. And then I decided to get a job in a bank. One of the most glamorous jobs in the world, bank teller. All right, so, <laughs> all right, so I'm doing that. Uh, did it for about a year and a half, and then all of a sudden, I start thinking that this is not right. There's something missing here. I meet people in, in my circles of friends that are doctors and uh, engineers and technologists and stuff. I'm, I'm missing something here. So, got back. And it was even more difficult because, because my mother said, you know, I can get you, she was connected with the government. And so she got me a job in the government. She said, but the proviso is you have to study at night. So, that's tough, guys. That's really tough. Because you have your day job, and then you have to go study and whatever. Never mind. So it was incredible. But I got my diploma. Awesome. You know, I, now you should see my transcript. <laughs> From the first two and a half years to the other side, it's unbelievable. It's like, it's the same person. Okay, but I got motivated, and I got excited about, you know, about business administration. Because then, when I was doing what I wanted to do, that was the thing that took me there, okay? Lesson learned, okay? So, the only thing is that I was in Puerto Rico, and Puerto Rico is not known to be, you know, one of the biggest employers in the world, so all of a sudden I'm saying, hmm, I, I don't know, I'm interviewing whatever, doesn't look good. So guess what? I took off. I took a leap of faith, and I moved to New York, and <laughs> by myself, and a cousin of mine, and we shared an apartment, whatever, blah, blah, you know, if I can make it there, I can make it anywhere. I, I said, what am I going to do here? Well, uh, I, know, I know how to be a teller, so let me apply for that kind of stuff. In one month, I got a job at a bank, and she said, no, no, you belong in customer service. Yeah, okay, so customer service it is. They put me in a Park Avenue office, whatever. I don't want to tell you the horrors that I, that, <laughs> never mind. So anyway, but... The point is, from there, they opened the bank, opened the systems area. And I'm like, hmm, okay, that sounds interesting. So I actually gravitated into that area. I started looking at systems and procedures. That's what it used to be called. Anything, everything was manual, and a lot of PCs, and didn't exist at the time, whatever. And so, but I got my, my foot in the door, and I started <laughs> progressing to a number of jobs in the systems area in various companies. So. <clears throat> make a, a long story short, I worked for MedLife, I worked for Continental Insurance, I worked for EMI Music, 
I worked for Citigroup. I worked for the New York Stock Exchange. And that was my last job in New York, 10 years. Awesome. We actually, my team, I had a team of 35 people that were actually automating the systems of the exchange. Uh, as you know, they, you know they, what you might not know is that they merged with a uh, European company. And so we had to merge the two. So we knew that we were getting ourselves out of a job. But we did a fantastic job because now the systems are all automated. So it was great. So I made it there, okay? So the thing that got me to the project management space was that when I first got my job at City at Citigroup, my manager came to me, this is I mean fresh, because I was just doing some some small automation jobs and you know like training and, and PC stuff, whatever. He says to me, here, I'm gonna give you half a million bucks and an empty floor in the main uh, building in New York of the City Court Center. This floor is yours. You have half a million bucks. You need to enable this floor to become a, a center where we're gonna merge two companies. <coughs> and I'm like, to build what? <laughs> <laughs> Never done this before. You know, but hey, you know what? I'm excited about this. I had six months to do it. I had to do the floors, I had to do the cable, I had to do hire vendors to do the computer stuff, I had to do the software, they pick the applications and stuff like that. So to make long story short, in six months it was done. It was done. We went to celebrate, we went on a boat around Manhattan, and I get an award, service excellence award for having done that. Tell me if that doesn't make you an addict. Okay, because I'm like, I want more of this. Okay, this is, this is awesome. I did well, and this is what I want to do with my life. <clears throat> so I'm hooked, all right? So that's my passion. <laughs> now, <laughs> I'm saying this because between finding my passion, right, which was the city group, and later on, you don't necessarily always have to stay in the same place. So I knew what my passion was, and if things were not going well, and I tried to fix it and it didn't work, I'm out of it, okay? And this is what you need to think about. People used to have long careers in companies and stuff like that. It doesn't tend to happen anymore. So the point is, you need to educate yourself in a way that you can do anything you, your passion takes you to. So that's, that's my thing. All right, so from what to stay, just like that. So basically, again, from me saying, wow, this is what I want to do, to now, where I'm in this fantastic company, that gives me the opportunity to be who I am, to do what I want to do. I get very much empowerment. I go to my VP and she says, I say, you know, I'm thinking about this, right? Do it. Oh, I'm thinking about that, do it. I mean, what, what else can you ask for, right? It, it's awesome. So, I'm loving it. So, to give you an idea of some of the opportunities in the PMO, I manage, <clears throat> we have portfolios of projects. Uh, uh, automation that are part of the technology area. And so, mine happens to be the infrastructure and operations portfolio. So we manage projects that have to do <coughs> with installing things in the, in the stores, in the various dealerships, Wi-Fi, switches, phones, iPads, anything, any technology that David was talking about, we have to, we have to take care of enabling the dealerships to be able to implement. So it's a really exciting uh, thing to do. There's also corporate systems portfolio, customer care, all these various areas are represented and we actually have portfolios that help all these uh, areas be successful. So it is also the fact that we have uh, internship opportunity outside of uh, our area, so in, in technology, programming, you know, uh, BI, all that, they're available. So if you want to talk to Michelle about that. All right. So. What is my day like? Right, so, coffee first. So, I get there. I'm, I'm an early riser, so I get there at about 6 or 7.30 in the morning. That's because of me, I want to do it. And uh, we have a place in the 15th floor of the, uh, the Sendia uh, Automation Building downtown. And it's called the Intersection. And it's a cool place, because you go there to have coffee, to meet friends, to maybe have a meeting if you want, to chill out, you make a phone call. It's a great place, so go up there, Take care of it. <clears throat> then I come down to my desk, excuse me, and organizing my day and whatever, and then all of a sudden, we're on fire. There's an email, something happens. Oh my God, 
stop, whatever. So you have to multitask. It's fine. Uh, tends to happen a lot, but if you're organized, it, it's, you, you can handle it better. We also take care of our projects. In, in my case, I have six project managers reporting to. And so I gotta make sure they're all updating their project. We have a tool that we use for that, where we manage everything from the actual projects, the tasks, the resources, the financials, the status reports, everything. Okay, and that's, it's not easy to get a tool to do that for you, but we have implemented it in such a way that it does a fantastic job. So the other thing is walking around. I do, that, I do that a lot because I don't believe in sitting at my desk for more than 10 minutes. I think I like to see people's faces. I like to talk to you personally and say, how are you doing, whatever, how's your day? And by the way, you put together so much information from gossip and everything that it's unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always connected. So, uh, I know, I, I, you always look too serious in business. <laughs> right, so, anyway, there's some ugly stuff that you have to do. That's just the way it is. I mean, it happens, right? So, but if you organize yourself way, you'll be fine. And then meetings, with, we have meetings with everyone, everybody. We meet with vice presidents, senior people, executives, whoever. But that, that's the joy that I find in, in project management. Because I get stimulated by those relationships that you build, right? And then closing shop is just, you know, by 4.35, I'm on the way home, and of course, I get connected because I, I can't be unconnected, and so, you know, but that's the way, you know, that my day goes. So you had some observations and tips. I'm rushing because I know that it's gonna be five minutes, but uh, so PM jobs are in high demand right now. We, we have a hard time finding great, great project managers. And when we find them, I have, of the, I could say the six of them, but at least four of them are super staff. And just, they make me look good. And so I do everything I can to make them look good and to do good by them. So I, I need to understand the motivations, and we trust each other, we respect each other, and that's really critical. But uh, it's, it's hard to find good ones. We, we tend to have contract to hire at automation, so people come and say, okay, is it gonna be, you know, like in six months, a year, whatever? You say, well, if you do well, there's a possibility that you might be hired permanently. Who knows? But that's kind of like what we tend to do. Work hours, it varies. You know, some people come in at 10 or leave at seven, whatever. It's, it, I, I care more about the results. I don't, I don't want to look at the watch, at the clock. I'm just, I don't like to do that. If I tell you to do something and you do it for me in the space that I said, we're, we're good, okay? <laughs> so, uh, relationship building, that's huge. Okay. Uh, honestly, when I look at resume, it could be 10 pages long, you could have an incredible pedigree, but if you can't look me in the eye, we have a problem. And I, and I, I like that connection that people bring when, uh, when we're talking. When, and I ask simple questions, you know, how, how do you solve this problem? I, but in the meantime, I'm observing, okay? And I'm really, really interested in people that can work with me and that can trust me, so I can trust them. That's big. Um, resumes, again, could be, people say, I don't have a resume that has one more picture. I don't care. I've, been, I've had resumes that were like 10 pages long. I still read, read them because, hey, you know, you never know what you can find. So I don't like uh, standard statements like that. Emotional intelligence. This is big in companies right now. They say that emotional intelligence is a soft skill. Baloney. <laughs> to me, that is one of the most incredible skills that you can have when you get into a job. Okay, because if you cannot work with people, if you cannot let people talk, if you cannot, if you don't have uh, self-awareness to know who you are and what you can do and what help you can do for other people, it's not going to work because they won't they won't trust you and then that creates problems. So, I would encourage you to look at this topic. There's a lot of it out there. It's the latest thing, and I'm telling you, it's really, really critical. Uh, shadowing, also, we, we have people sometimes that come and, and do that. You know, it, it, we are happy to do that. I think, uh, I don't know if we are having that, that program by now, but I think we might. Yeah, we yeah. are considering, we've had a few students, not that many, from by and, and shadow us. Uh, we had, a few months we had in HR, uh, one of the students from Nova, uh, 
who was interested in, in human resources. And it was actually, it was really interesting because not only she learned how we do what we do, um, but we also learned from her. Um, she started sending us articles, like really interesting articles, basically on uh, recruiting and, you know, trying to avoid, because being a recruiter is tough. I mean, you, it's not just reading the resume, but at the moment that you're pre-screening a candidate, you've got to make sure that you're not hitting any, um, or saying anything wrong at the right moment, because you want them to open up. When I have to screen candidates, I try to make it a conversation. Of course, not right now, because like, I'm nervous, but um, <laughs> we try to have a nice conversation and let them walk me, you know, I ask them to walk me through their day, what's their experience, what they like the most about their job. I love shredding paper. That's my guilty pleasure. I just put Metallica stick in the shirt and start shredding paper. It's the best feeling ever. <laughs> I hate scanning. I have to scan it. <clears throat> so there's always something that you want to see what it is for them. And I've been learning that is if you make it a friendly enough, they'll open up. And they, you shouldn't be afraid of telling people what you like the most, what's your experience. So yes, resumes. Emotional intelligence is super important. Don't say you like hacking. No, I don't know how to do <laughs> no, that. that See, like an interview, that right? I know how to move all my stuff from one place to another in less than an hour, but <laughs> forget hacking. Emotional intelligence, intelligence, as we said, is really important. Um, I'm a very uh, emotional person, and it, sometimes it can be challenging to get yourself out of a situation, get those emotions out, and understand that it's just a message. Um, there are days where that will be harder than others while you're studying and working. I don't know if, if that's the situation with you guys. My experience was more or less similar to Luis. I had to work a full-time job. I also had a few um, stumbles across what I wanted to study. I started with education, then I changed to journalism. Uh, then I did then business administration. I realized I hit it numbers, and I ended up getting a bachelor in management because I wanted to go in human resources. It takes time, it's tough, um, but when you look back at it, you realize that, I mean, how far you can come, um, just making sure that you have your north, you know, that you follow that instinct, that if something isn't right, just stop. Analyze the situation, I know it's almost <laughs> over. Analyze the situation and make sure what is really making you happy and what's not. If something is not clear, just drop it and move forward from it. And then I'll keep talking after that. Now it's so that's, what I, have to that's what I have for you. So I think we're going to have some Q&A now, right? Okay? Thank Good. you. Good. Yes? Are you hiring just in the Fort Lauderdale office? Or are you looking for new hirees across the country? So um, right now, we have positions at the stores not only as a sales or as a technician, but there are also other positions that if you're interested to start there, it's, it's, um, it's amazing when you're at the store because you realize how the business starts working from there. From corporate, we support the stores. We try to make sure that everything works for them. But the stores is where you get that experience of how the bones, you know, how, it, how everything works, how the mechanic goes. So we are hiring everywhere. Um, not only at the stores, but also at our regions. We have the Western region, now we only have two, but we have the West region, Eastern region, and our corporate. It just depends on what you're looking for. Um, I would strongly invite you to go into jobs.automation.com and um, take a look at the opportunities that you're interested in. And um, I have a few cards, so I can give you my card. And if you see any position that you're interested in, I can get you in touch with the recruiter that's working on that one specifically. Oh, thank you. Yes. Other questions? Yeah. Do you guys promote a lot within, or? So yes, we have cases. Uh, we open our positions. So we had an opening. Uh, we open our positions internally. Of course, we're Um, just general tip, uh, whatever career you go into, you should always look for some sort of mentor where you work, uh, whether it's your direct manager or somebody within the function. Um, and a good conversation to have is like career progression. So, you know, stop. When you get there, like look at the opportunities, not where you want to get to, because anyway, any, any job 
you know, if I want to get a, a CISO at some point, I'm not going to get there to there in one year. And it's usually like stepping part and the CISO needs multiple skills and whatever. So it's growth. Like, the, the whole purpose of the manager is to help get better at that. So anywhere you go, whether it's us or anybody else, the sign of a good manager is somebody's helping you to succeed. If I help you get to where you want to go, you're going to be excited about your, what you want to do. And just like Lewis says, you know, if you follow your passion, then you know, you're happy to get up in the morning and you're happy to go to work. And it becomes more than just making money. Yeah. Great passion. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Um, I just have a question. Are, there any, some, are you guys currently accepting any summer internships? Yes, we are. Um, I'm going to give you my card. At the Fort Lauderdale? Location? Yes. So all of our summer internships are going to be at our corporate office in downtown Fort Lauderdale. Uh, our intention is to start interviewing around April, and uh, internships should begin in May, um, all the way through July. Those dates can change depending on your schedules um, at school. So if it has to be a little, a little <coughs> bit more towards June, then we can go June through August. We have about six in the, in the project management area. So um, that's a good thing. I, I actually looked at it today. <laughs> refresh a little bit because um, there were so many things I wanted to tell you guys, and I couldn't even say out of it. Um, it's 32 hours. Uh, basically, if it's Monday through Friday, it depends on the hiring manager and the need. Also, they are flexible, so depending on your schedule, whatever other activity you have during the summer. Um, Academic wise, then you'll work around it. But it shouldn't be more than 32 hours a week. They are paid. <laughs> yes. I should have started with that. They are paid. Are paid. Uh, and we are um, paying $15 an hour. Um, and I think that's it. Okay. So, when you started about project in your what was one of the challenges you had? Challenges. So, first of all, it was. It was trying to understand uh, the extent of the job. Because it's not just about taking the, the boxes, you know. It's not just firing up MS project and say, this task is done, this task is done. No. It's about looking at the overall picture, again, working on those relationships to make sure that the project is, is going well, understanding and identifying risks and issues, making sure that all the proper resources are allocated, bringing up things that need to be escalated to management. So there's a whole bunch of things that you do around it. And when you first start, you kind of embrace the, the tool. And then you say, ah, this is what I'm, yeah, I did great. But no, because if you miss a risk, if something happened and you, your project went out of you know, the schedule, you blew the schedule or the budget or the scope, you're nowhere. So it, it takes a while to get maturity into doing that. But if you are, you know, if you listen and, and you're, again, your emotional intelligence is telling you, you know, I need to work on these issues with these people. And, and it's all about people, people management, more, more than project management, to be honest with you. So, I'm kind of like, I'm curious, like, what are the I uh, make mistakes. That's to be expected. You're human. Okay? The important thing, number one, is to recognize that you make a mistake and to own it. Okay? You don't try to cover it up. You don't try to you know, blame it on somebody else. You just, obviously, from, from that experience, you need to learn. Okay? And then as you keep doing that throughout your career, you will get better at not making that many mistakes. And if, yeah, there might be simple mistakes. I forgot this. But obviously, if you made a $20 million mistake, you got a problem. <laughs> but but uh, no, the point is, yeah, you, as you 
I, I see that you have that little fear there. It'll get better as you start getting more season at the project now. Yes? You said you had uh, six managers reporting to you, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, from those six managers, what made them, you know, you said you had four, but you could possibly say six are all star quality. What makes them a star quality in your eyes? What, what uh, traits, skills? That's a great question. It's a great question. First of all, uh, they run on, on their own, okay? And I don't like to micromanage people, and they don't need micromanaging. They do exactly what they need to do to get this project to be successful. They know how, obviously we, we have a framework that we follow, and you know, if it's agile, if it's waterfall, if it's blend, if it's whatever, they know how we do the job in, in the company, and we tend to, when we, when we onboard new project managers, we actually make sure that they are coached and that we're all doing basically the same things the same way, right? So the ones that I'm telling you are superstars, again, they don't need my daily coaching. We have our one-on-one -on -one once a week, uh, each one separately. We have our status meeting once a week, and that's enough fuel for them to do what they have to do. And I, and it, it, I see the results, and that's what tells me. And they get awards, and they get recognized. And they, you know, I, I get phone calls, oh, this person is fabulous, whatever. That's how you. Yeah. So I saw that on the slide, they mentioned cybersecurity. So do the project managers and like the more tech side of the company kind of like go hand in hand with the project and like that? <coughs> how would like a cybersecurity project go? I, another great question. You wanna? I'm actually in cybersecurity. Yes. So. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I look that way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> We have our own project, so it, depending on what it is, we'll, uh, you know, when it comes to cybersecurity, we either involve in projects or we put our own projects. So, and in terms of our project, it'll be things like some sort of cybersecurity solution. So we're deploying a new firewall um, technology. We need a project because we need networking involved, we need infrastructure involved to actually install the hardware, um, we need PM to align with the vendors and stuff. So, we have our own dedicated projects for security, so like one of the big ones I'm running is the um, California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, so California is coming up with their own privacy act, which means that any customer data we have for California residents, we've got to be able to tag track. If they come to us and say, what is that, what data do you have on me, please can you delete it? We've got to do that, and that's a major project that involves not just technology, it needs sales, marketing, uh, operations, uh, servicing, we've got to involve all of our all areas of business. So even though it's a cybersecurity project, it's you know big project managed across more of the functions of the business. So um, and then on the other side, you know, other portfolios like customer care and all that sort of stuff, if they're deploying like new diagnostics tools and stuff, they've got to put that onto a network. Cybersecurity's got to be involved to risk assessment like is this incident facing? Do we have to open ports on firewalls? That sort of thing. So it, it's a mix of direct projects that we own versus yeah, and we're actually working closely now because uh, there used to be a separate portfolio for security, but they kind of blended it into my portfolio. So it's even better because we, we have a lot of uh, you know, things that are common and dependencies between each other, and that works really well. I have a question for you. Yes, sir. Um, I have one for you later. Yeah, concerning <laughs> most, most of the stuff in information technology is project oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any methodologies or frameworks you recommend? kids should look into, just to get familiar with general project management? Yeah, yeah, I mean, obviously, you, you go out there and you can do all kinds of searches about, you know, methodologies like Agile and, and, and Waterfall and Blend and whatever. Uh, there, there is in, in, an infinite variety of things that you use or, or methods or, or uh, procedures, processes to, to manage projects. Uh, Get educated on everything that you see. It's like a sort of like a sponge, right? Because you don't know. You know I always say, you know, project management is like a box of chocolates. You, you never know what you're get, right? So, so, so who knows? Right? Who knew? I'm, I'm going to give you a quick example. I would, before uh, automation, I would be in family enterprises, and one of the things that we used to do every year was to come here to FAU, to the K Auditorium, and we had. A, a, an affair for a thousand people in the company. It was like the state of the union, but the state of the company for the chairman. We did we did it all, you know, a broadcast on the web. We did it. It is the most amazing thing for me because it's like a, a production company. I worked with the, with the production company, with the network people, with whatever. 
and I'm walking around with this cool headset listening to the commands. Project management? Well, yeah, it is, right? So, or, or another job in New York, EMI Music. Spent days and days at Abbey Road Studios in London, working out of there. I used to go where the videos used to, to fail to you know, record. I'm like, oh my God, but can I find, find the hair from John Lennon around here or something? <laughs> so, yeah, so really. So it, it all depends, and it, it is exciting because uh, it, 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 you know, anything is a project. Brushing your teeth is a project. So read up and get yourself into trainings and stuff like that gets you closer to that. Does that answer your question? And since I know Jonathan's making us yeah. <laughs> I do have a few more things to say, and I'll be really quick. Um, one of the things that I can advise you um, to start preparing um, yes, emotional intelligence, huge. Time management, um, try to get some training on that. It's gonna help you at the moment that you have to start scheduling stuff, set times and respect those times to that assignment. There are assignments in your career that are not negotiable. So if you have something and you have a time frame for that, leave it there. Any other thing can be scheduled. That's gonna help you be quicker what you're doing instead of multitasking or switch tasking, which can be sometimes um, a little confusing because you'll drop the ball somewhere. Mistakes are gonna happen, don't be afraid of it. I make mistakes every day, I got two boys. It's, <laughs> I make mistakes every day. But the thing is your attitude on how you're going to face those mistakes and how you're gonna solve that. There's not one solution to a situation, you're gonna have several and if you need help, ask for help. Um, there is a saying in Spanish that uh, it's, uh, there isn't a stupid question, if there's a stupid that won't ask that question. Um, don't be afraid to ask questions. Every time, you'll be 80, ask the question. Um, if you have any doubt, stop, try to analyze the situation, and if for some reason, as I said before, it doesn't seem right, just walk away from it go into something else that's gonna be more productive of your time, something that's gonna help you grow. Try to absorb as much as you can from the people around you. What skills do you like, or what skills do you admire of someone that you're working with? Try to learn from them as much as you can. And if someone needs help, go ahead and help. Um, not just take stuff away from people, but also give back. There is an amazing feeling when you have someone that comes to your desk and tells you, hey, I thought of you because you taught me this, and I don't know, from the stupid as a V lookup, you taught me how to do this, program, I get this done in five minutes, that stuff. I have, uh, I sit on a cubicle, so of course my door's always open, um, but I think that having that experience of customer service and not just doing things because it's on your job description, try always to go that extra mile, that's people will remember you for that and will value your every collaboration that you can give them. Whoever comes to my desk and they know it, we're on different floors, but if they need me, I'm there. Whatever they need, I'm recruiting. I might not know how to set up a computer or anything, but I get calls from new hires, hey, my printer's not set up, not my fault, my architecture, but I go anyway, here, done, have fun. <laughs> Welcome to the team, be that person. Not just, oh, that's not my problem. No, don't be indifferent. So that's it. I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for coming. We get that your little Samisa. Thank you. Oh, thank you for having Thank you. Okay. Thanks. So thanks, everybody, so much for coming. Uh, again, we'll be here for a little bit if you want to do some one on ones and chat with them individually. Uh, if you didn't get a chance, make sure you sign in. We've still got the pizza left. And then if you can, come up to the front so we can do our group photo. And then we'll be good to go. All right.